It is now time for a question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you very much and good morning, Speaker. My question, uh, questions are for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Uh, our resolve was tested today, but uh, by us being here, Premier, we have passed. So thank you for carrying on. I know that you and I agree that governments must focus on delivering prosperity, a better quality of life, and accountability in government. I believe that you and I both entered politics and public life to deliver on those goals. But Ontario isn't what it could be or should be. Under your government, Ontario is home to Canada's largest deficit, larger in fact than the federal government and all other provinces combined. Despite that, you continue to say you will balance the budget by 2017 and that budget targets would be imperiled if the province had to sacrifice investments in jobs, growth or families. Question. Premier, why do you believe that fiscal prudence is inconsistent with strong jobs, strong growth, and strong families. Thank you, Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I actually believe that fiscal prudence and uh, a strong economy are connected. I think that they are absolutely connected, and that's why we have remained committed to our, um, our elimination of the deficit by 2017-18. That's what we ran on. That's the plan that we have in place. That's the plan that we are executing. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we know that uh, making sure that communities have the infrastructure that they need to be able to thrive, understanding that there need to continue to be investments in people's talent and skills, and quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, partnering with business to make sure that business has the opportunity to flourish, that all of those things have to be in place in order for the economy to thrive. So those things are integrally connected in, uh, in our plan, Answer. and I believe that is the best course, the best balanced and practical course for the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Premier, you continue to protect your deficits, your deficit of ideas, your deficit of vision, and your deficit of hope. We know that you peaked your deficit at $19.3 billion, and incredibly, you have 61% of your deficit reduction left until the end. At the rate you're going, Premier, you won't balance for another 15 years. Premier, it's time to come clean. Your $9.2 billion deficit grew to $10.5 billion last year and is forecasted to $12.5 billion this very year. Frankly, no one believes you're going to balance. So, Premier, when will you get Question. back to balance and make Ontario first? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As we have committed and as we are on track to do, we will eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. Mr. Speaker, in terms of uh, the party that presented a hopeful option, a hopeful vision of this province, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think that is that is the the vision that we brought to the people of the province, Mr. Speaker. That is the vision that we uh, ensconced in our budget when we uh, introduced it in this past May, and then we ran on that budget and we uh, we brought that budget back to the legislature, Mr. Speaker. That is the plan that we are implementing at this point, and that is exactly about the optimism of this province. It's why, Mr. Speaker, I will be traveling with a, a delegation to China, Mr. Speaker, to uh, to meet with our to meet with our uh, friends and uh, partners in Jiangsu uh, province, but also in Beijing and Shanghai, to talk about how we can increase that relationship and increase our trade Thank relationship. You. That's part of our Thank economic you. growth. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, Premier, the people of Ontario are suffering under the rigid ideology of this government. We yearn for an approach that is pragmatic. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock. I'm giving you some quiet. And it'll stay that way. Finish, please. Speaker. Premier, when you addressed Mr. the Bagger Canada 2020 conference, you praised your government for, quote, rejecting strict ideology, but rationalizing waste and scandal from the gas plants, as, a, as an example, during a stalled economy is purely ideological. You threaten Ontario's prosperity, our quality of life, and our place in the world. Your government is on a dangerous path. Our debt Member is five times Lawrence, as large as California, and we're piling on $11 billion in interest every year. 
Our credit outlook is negative, and the credit Question. agencies don't believe in your reduction timelines. Premier, how are you going to get us back to balance and make Ontario first? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the same bleak view of the world that uh, his party, the uh, member opposite's party, brought to the people of Ontario is the same bleak view that he is uh, he's espousing again this morning, Mr. Speaker. And in terms of uh, an ideological response to the economic situation, I can't think of a more ideological response than cutting 100,000 jobs and slashing services across. Government, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly what uh, that party proposed to do. We are committed to eliminating the deficit by 2017-18, Mr. Speaker. We are investing in the talent and the skills of our our people, Mr. Speaker. We are investing Member in infrastructure North, order, that please. will foster economic growth in the long term and will create jobs and create prosperity in the short term, Mr. Speaker. That's the Answer. plan that we ran on, that's the plan that we're implementing, and that is the plan that holds hope for the people of Ontario, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. New question. The member from Nicholson. Thank you. Uh, my new questions are for the Premier. I believe that Ontario is the land of opportunity because it has been fostered by a spirit of free enterprise. Premier, this week is Small Business Week, and I'm sure you know that small businesses are how we make Ontario first. In towns and cities across our province, small businesses are the private sector job creators. I know the struggles of these men and women, as I'm a lifelong entrepreneur, opened my first company when I was 16 years old. But, Premier, under this Liberal government, you have driven out small business. There, are tw there were 2,700 fewer small businesses in Ontario last year than there were the year before. Wow. Pr Speaker, my question is simple. Why are you so keen to drive out small business instead of helping build themselves up? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I know that the Minister of Economic Development is going to want to uh, comment on what's actually happening in the province, Mr. Mm -hmm. Speaker. But what I want, I want the people of Ontario to know is that we are very focused on partnering with those very businesses, creating an opportunity for more of those small businesses to start. That's what innovation is about. You know, when we talk about in innovation, we talk about startup companies, we talk about commercializing. We're talking about creating an environment where there's enough capital to invest where there's the opportunity for those businesses to grow. It's why, Mr. Speaker, it's very important that when, when we go on trade missions, when we travel internationally, we open doors for and make connections for small businesses that otherwise might not be able to develop those relationships in other countries. That's exactly what we are Answer. doing when we go to China, Mr. Speaker, when we, uh, we take this trade mission. So fostering an environment for small businesses, medium enterprises Thank to you. grow, that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, entrepreneurship is often a hard road. There are going to be lean times. In my early years, I recall taking the uh, Chamber of Commerce first dollar of profit certificate, cracking it open and using that dollar to buy lunch. That's the reality of being in your own business. Entrepreneurs have an unwavering dream. We dream of creating something that wasn't there before, hiring more people, creating jobs. But here in Ontario, you have created something different. You have created the highest cost business environment. And now you're going to hit business with a new pension tax, one that business say will force them to fire employees and reduce the wages for those employees who are left. Premier, why don't you listen to the advice of the Canadian Federation of Independent Business Question. and abandon this new pension tax? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Trade, well, Employment thank you, and Mr. Infrastructure. It's a long name, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, thank you, though. <laughs> I have trouble with the two sometimes. But I, you know, I, I have to correct the member opposite, who's talking down the advances our small business uh, community has made in this province. I don't know if the member is aware of this, but small business jobs have grown since uh, b from 2020-12-13 by over 87,000 jobs. So the story you're telling is absolutely patently false. Jobs are growing in our small business community. And the Premier touched on something very, very important. Just yesterday, Mr. Member Speaker, from Simcoe North, come to order, they please. Are. Just yesterday, I was meeting with a small business startup, Mr. Speaker, that's coming to China with the Premier and the Minister responsible for trade and myself. 
called Chip Care, Mr. Speaker. They've developed a, an incredible technology that's going to make blood testing. Uh, actually, it's a lab almost in a box, Mr. Speaker, in a, in a handheld. They're coming to China with us because they're going to build those those devices here. They want to market them in China and they want to attract investment. Answer. Those are the kind of companies, Mr. Speaker, that that our our initiatives are supporting. Those are the kind of companies that represent Thank our next you. generation economy. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, the facts hurt. I understand that the facts hurt, but Premier, small business would love to hear some good news from you. Instead, your own Ministry of Finance tells us that growth was actually less than forecast, and you raided the piggy bank to make your deficit look even smaller. Instead of incentives to grow, you promise a new payroll tax. Instead of making Ontario first, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business ranked Ontario eighth out of the 10 provinces when it comes to tax policies. Instead of growing this valuable sector, as the facts showed, there are 2,700 fewer small businesses today. Premier, small business owners have the answers. When are you going to stop punishing them and start listening to them? Minister. But then let's talk about the Canadian Federation of Independent Business, Mr. Speaker, and the high ranking that they've given this province as a result of the work done by my predecessor. And actually, when I was in this post before, uh, our, our efforts to reduce regulatory burdens across this province by 17 percent, that focuses very much on small businesses, Mr. Speaker, earned us, I believe it was an A or an A minus highest in the country, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to reducing regulatory burden. We're working very hard with our small business and medium-sized business community. We know that they're the backbone of our economy. That's why we're pleased that they're up 87,000 jobs since 2012-2013. We're not going to take the members' advice and talk down those small businesses. They're working hard to grow our economy. We're proud of the work they're doing. We're proud of the growth that they're experiencing in Ontario, and we're going to keep working with them, Mr. Speaker, to keep creating Creating jobs Thank you. and build a strong economy in this province. Good question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Premier. Whether it's uh, cancelling gas plants or bailing out Mars, this Liberal government likes to keep its secrets in Cabinet's cone of silence. And yet, this Premier says she's different. She insists that she's going to lead the most transparent government in all of Canada, Speaker. So, has the Cabinet actually been briefed on the privatization of Ontarians, Ontario's local hydro utilities, and will Cabinet be discuss, discussing that today, Speaker? Premier, <laughs> you, we all have. So have you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and as the leader of the third party knows, we asked uh, Ed Clark, who is a well-respected expert to uh, lead a group Even of people, like uh, include, including Francis Lankin and Janet Ecker, to look at how to optimize the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. Uh, he, has, he has indicated publicly the direction that, uh, that he thinks we should go. Uh, obviously, we have been in close contact with him as he uh, prepares to, uh, develop, to release his interim report. And, we look forward to uh, we look forward to his advice and the advice of his council. Supplementary. Speaker, on Monday the premier laughed at Ontarians' concerns that she's privatizing assets, but Ed Clark was crystal clear the government plan is to sell the distribution network, quote, bring in private capital, sell down our interest in public utilities and public hydro utilities. Speaker, is the premier going to keep denying that her government is privatizing hydro? Premier. Mr. Speaker, what I, am, what I am going to keep emphasizing is that we have to take practical and sensible steps in order to make sure that the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario are working to their highest capacity in order that we can then take the benefit of those assets and reinvest it in assets that are needed for the future, Mr. Speaker. That is what we put in our plan. That is what we said we were going to do in our budget because we know that if we don't find the funding to invest in transportation and transportation infrastructure today, then we're not going to have that infrastructure for the future. And so it is responsible and practical that we look at the way uh, our, these assets, whether it's Hydro One or whether it's the LCBO, to make sure that they are working to the Answer. greatest benefit of the people of the province. That's what Ed Clark's doing, and I look forward to his interim report. 
Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, we have records that show that besides meeting with the Premier, Ed Clark met with Ministers Shirelli, Duguid, Matthews and Sousa. But the section of the memo that lists the key themes of those meetings have been removed. Now, when the Premier and the members of her inner circle met with Ed Clark, did they talk about selling off our shared public assets like our public hydro utilities? Well, Mr. Speaker, I hope that those conversations were wide-ranging. Because if you don't have a wide-ranging conversation, if you don't look at what all the options are, then you're not going to come up with the right answer. And so to only look at the most narrow, ideologically correct version of possibilities is not going to get you to the right answer. So I hope, Mr. Speaker, that those conversations were very broad. We know, we know because of what uh, Ed Clark has said publicly the direction that he is going to be suggesting we go and i am very interest in, interested in hearing his uh, in hearing and reading his interim report because i think that he's done exactly what we asked him to do and that is look at the assets that are owned by the people of ontario and figure out how we can make them work better for the people of ontario Thank you. New question. The well, the next question is also for the uh, Premier Speaker. The uh, same records that we've obtained uh, show that Ed Clark hired multiple consulting firms to put together his plan for selling off shared assets like local hydro utilities. My question is a simple one. Who are these consulting firms, Speaker? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, again. We have asked an expert in uh, the field of financing to look at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario that are very valuable, Mr. Speaker, and we've asked him to, uh, with his panel, give us some advice on how we could optimize those assets. What we didn't do, Mr. Speaker, is we didn't make a, a back-of-the-napkin decision, as was made by a previous government, to sell off an asset like the 407 to no long-term benefit of the people of of the province, Mr. Speaker. We've taken a very thoughtful and practical approach because we know that we need to be able to make investments in assets that are needed today and into the future, and we know that we need the funding for that. And that's why Ed Clark has done the work that he's done, and I look forward to his interim report. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the government was hiring private consultants to help out with the Liberal fire sale and privatization of Ontario's shared public assets like our public hydro utilities. That's clear. So if the Premier is not prepared to be transparent with the people of Ontario about who those consultants are, perhaps at least she can tell the people of Ontario how much they've been paid. Premier. Speaker. I mean, it's, it's very interesting to me. I mean, we have committed to invest $130 billion in roads and bridges and schools and transit over the next 10 years, Mr. Speaker, because we know that that kind of investment is what is necessary. But we also know that we have to be responsible as we move forward. We know that we have to make decisions that are responsible for the long term. And in order Deputy to do House that, Leader, we order, have to please. talk to people who are experts. We have to talk to people who understand the world of financing, who understand the world of investment, who understand the world of infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. So that's what we have done. We asked Ed Clark with his counsel to come up with some advice. And I hope, again, I will say to the leader of the third party, I hope Answer. he's talked to who he needs to talk to to get the very best advice so we make the best long-term decisions for the people of this province. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, we know that when it comes to producing business cases, the Premier keeps saying that the dog ate her homework. Ontario deserves to know, Ontarians deserve to know whether any of these consulting firms produced a business case for the fire sale of their shared public asset, assets. Now, will she make the consultants' reports available for the public immediately, Speaker? Thank you. So, so again, Mr. Speaker, the interim report and then the final report of the uh, of the uh, group that uh, Ed Clark has been working with are not yet uh, finalized, Mr. Speaker. But I'm looking forward to those. I just want to step back and talk about why we are doing this. You know, our our plan to maximize the value of 
the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario is not a whim on our part, Mr. Speaker. It is actually a very important part of our plan to make investments. And the investments that we want to make are, uh, are investments that will have long-term benefit, Mr. Speaker. And so investing in regional express rail, investing in 15-minute go service, full-day two-way go service, investing in the Brampton Queen Street Rapid Transit Line, Mr. Speaker, investing in the Downtown Relief Line, the Hamilton Light Rail Transit, the next phase of the LRT in Ottawa, expansion of highways like number seven, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that communities are able to thrive. That's why we're doing this. That's why this is so important, and it's so important that we get it right. Thank you. New question? Member from Lanark, Farnock, Lennox, and Addington. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, since 2011, your government has known the details of the loan agreement with Mars Phase 2. It has never found the right time to be either open or transparent about it. In 2008, the economic recession hit Alexandria ARE and their share value plummeted to over 60%. After three years of stalled development, in 2011, your government provided Mars a $224 million loan to complete the project, as ARE could no longer meet their obligations. No financial institution was willing to back the project, with only 10% of the building pre-leased, 30 to 40% lower than industry standards. Premier, at the time of the loan, what terms of the contract between ARE and Mars were amended to protect this risky taxpayer investment? Question, thank you. Development, employment, and infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Development, Employment, and Infrastructure. Well, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, I've made it very clear, and I've said it in the legislature, I've said it in the committee, I've said it outside of this legislature, that we're doing everything we can to bring forward uh, requests for information, and anything that's not commercially sensitive will absolutely be shared. That's fair, Mr. Speaker. It's what we can do, it's what we should do, and we're happy to be transparent, as transparent as possible about all of that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, this is the difference between that party and our party. Yes, uh, Mars is a project, a viable project that, that Mars Phase 2, that ran into some trouble during the recession. Yes, we were there, Mr. Speaker, to support them, to try to do everything we could to see this project through. Unlike the PCs, Mr. Speaker, whose position quite clearly was to let that project rot in the ground. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about a sector with 51,000 high-paying jobs, yes, a sir. sector that, has, that contributes $39 billion to our economy. This is an important sector, Mr. Speaker. We're going to keep you. working to create jobs in the sector, even Thank if you. the Tory economy is low and Supplementary. Back to the Premier, uh, Premier, that your minister failed to answer. ARE originally took all the risk with Phase 2 by supplying both the capital and the management of the project. The only contribution from Mars was providing the land valued at $15 million. Understandably, ARE was in line to receive the lion's share of revenue from the leasing of Mars 2. Up until 2011, Mars was only due $715,000 per year from the total leasing revenue from Phase 2. When you provided Mars the loan, what did you forget to amend in the Mars ARE agreement that is now costing us an additional $65 million? Or did you just forget that ARE continued to be in line for 95% of the leasing revenues from Phase 2. Answer, thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I was available and stood for 10 and a half hours in Estimates Committee and, and answered all the questions that the opposition had for me. So I think what's important now, Mr. Speaker, is to speak about how important Mars is to our economy. So let me say something that neither comes from the opposition or the government, Mr. Speaker. This comes from Life Science Ontario, which is made up of the 1,600 companies, Mr. Speaker, that work in the bioscience sector. This is what they had to say, and they released this yesterday. The government of Ontario support of Mars is an example of Ontario's leadership and the leadership and with leadership comes risks now is not the time to second-guess the commitment that our government has shown by investing in innovation lest we rather seek to be followers and late adopters in this new global economy and live with the associated economic fallout this bold long-term vision is the driving force behind Mars and has enabled the Discovery District to become an international icon for innovation mr. speaker that was the vision 
of Ernie Eves Answer. in their previous government. That's our vision today. We stand by it. We're going to keep creating jobs. We're going to continue to grow a strong biosciences cluster Thank you. in Ontario. Questions? The members from Park Hyde Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is to the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government promised annual quotes unquote, dedicated funding for transit and transportation and, in fact, set up the Trillium Trust Fund that can only be used for infrastructure. But here's the catch. There's no legal guarantee that any money will ever make it to the Trillium Trust or make it to transit and infrastructure. This is a premier who insisted she was going to be different, but the Premier's quote-unquote dedicated plan doesn't actually dedicate anything. Does the Premier have a different de definition of dedicated than anyone else? Sir Finance. Sir Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh it is, as it's been stated in the budget, in a fall economic statement, in the creation of the Trillium Trust to ensure that funds that are uh, associated with the sale of specific assets or any of the uh, initiations that we put forward goes to the trust dedicated to, uh, to transit. We made that very clear, and that's how we'll proceed, Mr. Exactly. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Premier, uh, Mr. Speaker. Without long-term dedicated funding, of which there is none, there is no long-term transit planning. That's left people in my riding across Ontario packed into overcrowded public transit, waiting for an actual solution. There is a loophole in the Premier's quotes unquote dedicated transit funding plan so big you could actually drive a bus through that, Mr. Speaker. Will the Premier close that loophole and actually make dedicated funding dedicated? Would you answer my question this time? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, um, the, th <laughs> the third party has put forward uh, their proposals that includes the very issue that they're now denying. Yeah. Oh. They have put in their program, they copied exactly what we put forward in terms of assets. They're looking at optimizing, maximizing the values, and ensuring that any of the assets that are sold are then dedicated to the Trillium Trust that was developed for that purpose. They ran on that premise. Yeah. And furthermore, they said they would even do more. Yeah. Now they're afraid to talk about the very issues to look at ways to do just that. Mr. Speaker, the Trillium Trust was established. Funds that are uh, sold, any, any assets that are sold will go to the trust dedicated to transit. We have a plan for transit. We have a plan for public infrastructure. That's going to help grow our economy, and we're going to continue to do just that. Answer, thank you. Thank you. New question, the member from Greenier, Kurt Russell. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question this morning is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, under Premier Wynne's leadership, our government has placed a strong emphasis on supporting small, rural and northern communities across Ontario. Our government's economic plan is targeted to create jobs and spur economic growth, and we're focused on investing in people, investing in infrastructure, and supporting a dynamic and innovative business climate. Speaker, can the minister inform this House on how our government is investing in our northern Ontario communities to ensure they have the tools they need <laughs> to be competitive in the global market? Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Mr. thanks very much. I want to thank the member for uh, Glengarry Prescott Russell for the question, and certainly one of the programs that I am uh, really proud to share in my capacity as Minister of Northern Development and Mines is the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. And uh, although recently, actually, a member of the opposition was uh, actually bel belittling the important work of the NOHFC, uh, particularly related to our partnerships with the private sector, the facts absolutely speak for themselves. Speaker, over the last decade, the NOHFC has supported over 6,200 projects, creating or sustaining almost 24,000 jobs in Northern Ontario, and may I say, benefiting every single community across the North. So the fund has also invested over uh, $950 million over that time frame, leveraging $3.5 billion in additional investments for our province. Speaker, our government remains absolutely committed to uh, creating strong partnerships Answer. with businesses, communities, and people to help foster continued economic growth with a Certainly, a very strong emphasis on Northern Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It's clear that the hardworking minister is a strong advocate for Northern Ontario communities through work with the uh, Northern Her Ontario Heritage Fund. 
Agriculture is one industry that plays an important role in every community across the province, whether it's small, rural, urban, or no northern Ontario, and including my great riding of Glengarry, Prescott, and Russell. I know that northern Ontario holds a lot of potential when it comes to agriculture, and identifying and acting upon opportunities to support the agricultural industry is critical in building a prosperous Ontario. Sure. Speaker, I think we can all agree that efficient and modern infrastructure is the cornerstone for a strong northern economy. And I'm just going to ask the minister again to please inform the House on what our government is doing to support a strong, sustainable agricultural industry in northern Ontario through the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund. Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and again, thanks for the question. I mean, certainly uh, one of the exciting things about the economy in Northern Ontario is indeed the agricultural sector. We were The board was recently in New Lisgard, actually, and we were able to announce uh, close to $2 million there in funding for the through the Northern Ontario Farm Innovation Alliance uh, for to install tile drainage and uh, clear land over 3,800 acres uh, of land in Northern Ontario. And may I say, Mr. Speaker, the general manager of that alliance is Stephanie Van Hoff, the daughter of the uh, member for Tuskegee and Cochran. So, uh, clearly, the bright one in the family. Um, this child drainage. This tile drainage program is remarkable, and I, I know that many members have spoken about this. This allows the farmers to get out on the land weeks, if not uh, a month earlier, than they were expecting. It's dramatically increased the uh, return on investment for those farmers. This is great for all across the north. A number of farmers told me directly when we were in New Liskert that with the addition of tile drainage, they were actually and able sir? to double their yield. So this is a great program, a good example of economic development sure. and support through the Ministry of Agriculture for just some great economic Thank development you. in Northern Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member for Renfrew and Nicholson Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, earlier this month, Environmental Commissioner Gord Miller released his report, Managing New Challenges, where he recommends closing Algonquin Provincial Park to commercial timber harvest. In his report, Mr. Miller stated that closing the park to timber harvesting could somehow be done without negatively affecting the local economy. Everyone in the industry understands that the Commissioner is completely flawed in his premise. Furthermore, just last year, your ministry released a report affirming the practice of a responsible timber harvest in the park. The people of my riding and across the province need assurances from your government that it will continue to allow Algonquin to be a multi-use park. Minister, will you stand in your place today and pledge to the people of Ontario that you will reject Question. the Commissioner's recommendation for Algonquin Park. Speaker, thank you very much, and, uh, and I want to thank the member for the question. I understand how important issues related to Algonquin Park are to him as, as a member and to his entire constituency. Having said that, Speaker, I will also uh, uh, say in the House here today that we very much respect the work of the Environmental Commissioner. Uh, he has made commentary on the work that I do within my ministry and commentary on the work that other ministries do as well, and so we respect his work, we take his report, and we will thoroughly review what he has recommended to us. I am pleased, I would say, Speaker, that the EC has recognized my ministry's transparency and openness on a variety of issues, and we're thankful for that. And in the supplementary, I will respond more directly to the member's question and speak about what we have done very recently through the park management plan and the amendment that came into that plan and the Thanks, work sir. that will be going on in relation to this park on a go-forward basis. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I hope to hear that. I'm looking forward to it, Minister, because this is not the time for sparse, sparse statements or unclear language. Allowing for the continuation of the timber harvest in Algonquin Park is vital to the thousands of people in my riding and across eastern Ontario that rely on that for their livelihood. In addition, it has been demonstrated time and time again that Algonquin Park has the most stringent and comprehensive management system in the world. The multi-use function of Algonquin Park makes it a world leader in responsible resource management, and the millions of tourists who visit the park each year is a testament to that fact. Minister, I'm asking you again to do the right thing and unequivocally dismiss the Commissioner's recommendation. Will you do that today? Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I thank the member uh, for the supplementary. Of course, uh, I have no intention of the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry of shutting down forestry within Algonquin Park. Uh, having said that, the member will also be aware that that park management plan and the amendment within it did take 96,000 additional hectares about a year ago into protection. The important point for me to make to the member and to his constituency is that in no way, shape, or form did that uh, ex extra environmental protection impact the forestry operations that are going on in Algonquin. In fact, we can confirm that everybody who relies on forestry for their economic uh, sustainability uh, affected with logging in the park is still whole. There's plenty of work. As the member uh, from Thunder Bay, Atacoke, and I went through the forestry situation in 0506, we're seeing a rebound in forestry right now. All of the people that are making an economy and off sir. of the logging in the park are still able to do that. We're proud of that. We think we've landed it. It's a multi-use facility where a park has been for 150 years, and we see it remaining yeah, yeah. so in the foreseeable Thank you. future. Question, member from yes, my question is to the Premier. Premier, prior to the last election, you promised that PSW workers in this province would be getting a raise, and that's something that most, most people in this province support. The problem, however, is, is a number of PSW workers are not getting Order. workers. Imagine the surprise, the shock, and the sense of betrayal that the workers at the Canadian Red Cross in my riding found out when they got this letter. And it reads, the wage increase does not apply to every personal support worker. Our low acuity programs and all day programs are not included in the list of approved functional centres for the wage increase of 2014. Based on the criteria outlined by the Government of Ontario, your wages will not be changing this year. Shame. So, Premier, why did you break your word to these PSW workers? Shame. Premier. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I find it pretty rich coming from the NDP. So, this was an initiative, and I have to say, Mr. Speaker, an important one by our government that was in the platform during the election, it was in our budget as well, where we committed to, quite frankly, respecting our PSWs across this province by increasing their wages by $4 an hour over the next three years. As I said, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, our PSWs are personal support workers, and there are literally thousands of them working hard as we speak at this moment, helping people, helping our seniors in our homes, helping others in the community. We made a commitment not only to increase their wage so that they are respected for the hard work that they do every day, but also to engage on a program for sustainability of the sector Order. to make sure that they're not only valued, but that they have the supports in place so that they can succeed and provide that important and care that they do every day. Thank you. Supplementary. The problem is, like most promises made by Liberals, there's a but to it. In this particular case, a number of workers or PSW workers in my riding are not going to get the raise, and it's the same for other PSW workers around this province. So my question to you is a very direct one. Will you fund all PSW workers that are working in the home care sector, yes or no? Well, Mr. Speaker, we've worked closely with the sector, with the stakeholders and our partners in the sector to determine a program which will guarantee the sustainability of the sector and increase the wages. And again, I just have to reiterate that they not only didn't have it in their platform, Mr. Speaker. Reminder for members on this side not to talk while the answer is being given and a reminder on the opposite side to listen to the answer. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, they know, not only didn't have it in their platform, Mr. Speaker, they voted against our budget that contained this measure and catalyzed uh, an election which allowed us, fortunately, Mr. Speaker, to continue this, this process. We've added, in fact, 2,500 PSWs in our long-term care centres since 2008, 3 million additional PSW hours over the last three years. We're committed Never to this from Hamilton Mountain come to I'm not going to take lessons from the NDP party on this. This is the leadership of Thank the you. government of Ontario and the Liberal Party. Thank you. New question? Member from uh, Davenport. Thank you, Minister. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. 
In my riding of Davenport, many of my constituents rely on the support that the social assistance system provides both through Ontario Works and the Ontario Disability Support Program. These programs offer support for some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, and it is very important to my constituents that we provide the assistance to their neighbours in times of need. However, I have heard from some constituents who receive social assistance that they find it difficult to afford the costs of living. In my riding of Davenport, the Abrigo Centre and the Davenport Perth Neighbourhood and Community Health Centre provide and offer a number of important services such as employment linking programs and crisis services for women. They've also told me that some social assistance recipients have trouble making ends meet. Minister, can you tell us what your ministry is doing to support our most vulnerable citizens? Good. Thank you, Minister for Human Social Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for Davenport for this question because, of course, continuing to reform social assistance is a very important part of our government's work. We want to improve the social services system and make sure people in need can participate fully in our communities and in the economy. So it is to that end that over the past two years, our government has increased OW rates by $50 per month for single adults with no children. This year, we increased our investment in social assistance by continuing to lift up the lowest rates and increasing support for individuals with disabilities. The rate increases announced in the 2014 budget are now in effect, including a 1% increase for families receiving Ontario Works and for individuals with disabilities who rely on ODSP. Those individuals living Answer. north of the 50th parallel are getting an additional $50 per month for the first person in their family and $25 for each additional family member. Thank you. So in summary. Sorry. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Minister. I'm sure my constituents will be very happy and very pleased to know about the rate increases that are coming into effect this fall and the government's commitment to continue to transform the social assistance system. My constituents often mention their desire to become financially independent and move off the social assistance program. These individuals tell me they don't want to choose to be dependent on social assistance. However, they need support to order in order to establish the right skills so they can successfully find employment. Through you, Mr. Speaker, Minister, can you please inform this House of the actions your ministry has taken to assist these recipients of social assistance fulfill their desire for employment? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And these changes that we're making will promote greater independence by improving outcomes and encouraging work. For example, all social assistance clients will have access to a simple, flexible employment benefit that helps with their costs. Now people can earn up to $200 a month without affecting their assistance. And for earnings above $200, assistance rates are now reduced by 50 cents for every dollar earned. This allows clients to gain a foothold in the labor force, improve their incomes, and move towards greater independence. And our government has also made significant progress on the employment supports available for people receiving social assistance. And these positive changes include people who leave social assistance can go back to work and keep their drug, dental, and vision care benefits if they don't have comparable benefits from their employer. Answer. ODSP recipients who leave the program for a job can return to ODSP quickly if their job does not work out. We believe these are all very important Thank you. positive changes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Minister, after a decade of missed deadlines, the Highway 404 extension was built on the assumption that the project would use an asphalt surface instead of a concrete surface. However, the highway extension is in fact a concrete surface. This means that residents whose properties back onto the 404 extension are not sufficiently protected from the noise of the highway as they expected they would be. Concrete surface Member from Eglinton Lawrence will come to asphalt order. surface absorbs sound. It sounds like a jet taking off constantly, 24/7. This is not what these neighbours uh, agreed to. My constituents want to know Question. what you are going to do about it right now, not in a year's time. Right now. Thank you. 
Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I uh, want to thank the member opposite for that question regarding the Highway 404 extension. I also want to take a quick moment to thank her for being there on that very special day for York Region and for her community when I was in a position to stand alongside the new member from Newmarket Aurora and the new member from Barrie and the member who is, in fact, Speaker, asking me this question today to be together there with all of our municipal partners from that area to celebrate the 13-kilometre extension of Highway 4. Speaker, that's a $100 million investment in crucial transportation infrastructure that that member stood at the announcement for, the official opening for, and the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities and Research and Innovation was there that day as well, Speaker, and we all witnessed the member who's asking this very question being there with us to celebrate that opening. So I'm a bit confused about this question, Speaker, because I know in lots of communities across Ontario, a $100 million investment in crucial public transportation infrastructure would indeed be celebrated. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I find it fascinating that the um, minister doesn't want to deal with the actual issue. Because, of course, people have been waiting, as I said. This had been decades that people had been waiting. There was no question about that. What they didn't know was that the wrong assumptions had been made in the analysis of the kind of road that was to be built. What they didn't know was that until there was traffic on the road, what had, in fact, taken place. And so now we have a concrete road, which at the very least needs to be addressed. The assumptions built uh, on, that the road was built on was that it would be asphalt. So, Minister, my question is simple. Do you think that a chain-link fence is going to do it? We don't. Question. Thank you. Minister. So I, I, Speaker, I appreciate that follow-up question, of course, on this uh, same topic around this $100 million investment that our government has made to extend Highway 404 by 13 crucial kilometres in that part of York Region. Speaker, I have had the chance uh, since that day that I referenced in my initial answer when that member opposite stood beside me and my colleagues to celebrate the official opening for this 13-kilometre extension. Speaker. I've had the chance to speak with Mayor Hagson from East Gwillimbury. We've had a great conversation. The mayor is aware of the fact, as I believe the municipality is, that the Ministry of Transportation is undertaking a follow-up noise study uh, for that particular area, and we'll have those results over the next number of weeks. But I think it's also important to note, Speaker, that the new uh, Highway 404 four-lane extension is taking 22,000 vehicles a day off local roads, making the community safer while reducing travel times for commuters and commercial vehicles. It is no wonder, Speaker, that the member asking that question yes, was so happy on the day of the Very opening good. to stand alongside us and celebrate this investment. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. The Premier met with the parents and the community of Niagara on the Lake and promised to listen to their concerns and demands about keeping Parliament Oak Public School open. Two of those students are here today. They told her how much Parliament Oak School means to the children, the families, and the community. It is the heart of the old town, and it should be part of the future too. Instead, the community has happened to raise $100,000 for legal expenses to try to save the school, because this government will not grant them an appeal of the accommodation review process that led to the decision to close the school. Why won't the Premier help the people of Niagara Lake save their school? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Education is going to want to speak to this. I want to just welcome the, uh, your constituents to, uh, to the House today, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to reassure them that it is very important to us that school boards have the opportunity to make decisions about their communities. I don't think that it is in the best interest of education in this province that every local decision be made at Queen's Park. I think it's very important that elected school trustees work with the community to make decisions about the best delivery of program to the students in their constituencies, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, I know the Minister of Education will want to speak to this specific situation. Thank you, supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the Premier will be in Niagara on the Lake Thursday and Friday. She needs to explain to the community why she will not stand up for their school, 
why the government has divided communities across the province with a policy of closing schools. Over the summer, the Lord Mayor of Niagara Lake, Dave Eek, met with the mayors and the councillors from across the province. So it's not just a Niagara and Lake issue. They were looking to join forces and oppose this government's policy of closing schools in smaller rural communities. Why is the government forcing communities across the province to defend their local schools instead of doing its job to protect them and make sure we uphold high quality education for the students that are here today? Minister of Education. Minister of education. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And I do need to confirm what the Premier just said, which is that it's local school boards that make decisions about which school kids go to, why are the school boundaries, whether or not a school is open or closed. The community did ask us for to uh, ask for the ministry to review the uh, school accommodation, the park uh, process that went before the school uh, closure, and the authority that we have to review is to look whether the prescribed procedure was followed. The prescribed procedure was, was followed, and I have no authority to override the decision of the local school board, which is the way it should be, Speaker. It's very important that as we have local elections coming up on this uh, next Monday, which includes local Answer. elections for trustees, that people all across the province understand how important it is because there are many decisions Thank you. that are made by local trustees. Thank you. Your questions? The member from Beaches, East York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the last speaker, <clears throat> sorry, the very erudite guardian of knowledge acquisition for the province, the Minister of Education. Minister, I know that improving educational outcomes is a top priority of our government. And after speaking to constituents, I know and I've heard that our investments in early childhood education are very important to them. Full-day kindergarten is the most significant transformation in our education system in over a generation. Students in full-day kindergarten are now better prepared to enter grade one and will be more successful in school. Specifically, Mr. Speaker, a recent study compared students enrolled in full-day kindergarten and those in half-day half programs, and it showed that overall these students were better prepared when they went into grade one. So, Minister, can you please tell us, tell this House, what you are doing Question. to ensure that all students have access to full-day kindergarten? Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to uh, the member from Beaches Eat Shores for his question. He is absolutely right. The FDK implementation is an important milestone, and we're very proud of our full-day kindergarten program, which is the biggest transformation of our education system in a generation. The member opposite who was just heckling may be very interested to know that to date we have spent $1.5 billion on implementing kinder full-day kindergarten plus plus $1 billion in capital improvements to schools to allow for the implementation of full-day kindergarten. And this positions Ontario as a North American leader in the provision of education for our littlest students. It positions Ontario as a leader in, uh, in the education. And I do want to confirm what the member has said. Is We have a study conducted by Queen's and McMaster which shows us Thank you. Students in FDK. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, and, uh, I'm very excited to hear of these dollars that have been well spent in our schools, which I understand will benefit 265,000 children who were enrolled in full day kindergarten at 3,600 schools across Ontario. This is a great initiative that will not only benefit these children, but also the families and the teachers across the province. Minister, can you please elaborate on some of these other benefits that full-day kindergarten brings to Ontario? Thank you. Minister? Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. You know, we want to give kids the absolutely best start in life. And not only are the kids benefiting from the full-day kindergarten program, so are families and teachers across the province. So Ontario families who enroll a child in 
full day kindergarten, save up to $6,500 per child on child care costs. Uh, with the funding that I mentioned previously, we've built about 3,500 new kindergarten classrooms. We've got 3,800 additional teaching positions and 10,000 ECEs who are working with little children uh, in full day kindergarten. The studies from Queen's and McMaster have shown that students with two years of FDK have found to have significant proof in social competence development, Answer. language and cognitive development, and communication skills and general knowledge development. This is a great program to give our children the best start and Thank future you. success. Good question. The member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Environment. Minister, for months we've been trying to get air quality data for the Beachville area from your ministry. People who live there want to know the test results since the last public report was issued in 2003, but all your ministry has given us is six months of data. Now we're being told that we need to file an FOI request, which will cost $600 in order to get the information. Minister, are you honestly telling me that the people of Beachville need to pay your government $600 to find out if the air they are breathing is safe? Sir, the environment and climate change. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think the member and, uh, for Oxford and I have been working very closely on this file. I'm glad he's reintroduced the subject today. I was under the impression that the ministry was cooperating fully with the member opposite in the community. I'm disappointed to hear that there are some outstanding concerns, but I will sure, certainly take them to heart as I have before, and I will look into them and uh, promise him an answer uh, as promptly as possible within a week, I hope. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much for that answer, Minister, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate that your minister may, may not have been uh, 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 as forthcoming with information as they might have been. The problem is I did receive a letter with your signature on it, and, uh, uh, and this is where this question comes from. Your government claims to be open, transparent, but the people are being refused uh, information about the quality of the air they're breathing because that whole span of time is missing. It isn't classified business information, which the letter suggested, and it's not protected. The Operations Manual for Air Quality Monitoring in Ontario, produced by your ministry in March of 2008, says very clearly that monitoring data, as well as quarterly and annual reports, are to be made publicly available. All the people of Beachville want is to know that the air that they have been breathing is safe. They started the FOI process. Minister, will you do the right thing and refund the FOI fees and release the air quality monitor data from 2003 forward? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. One of the, the matters that does concern me is we have the application of, of Regulation 419, which, uh, whether you're in Sarnia, where we have concerns, or in Oxford, this is very top of mind to me. I'm working very closely with the Deputy. Uh, the Premier has asked us to up our game, both in being more transparent and more responsive. I, I, will, be, I, will, I will be the first to say that, uh, while I think there's great efforts being made by the Ministry, they are not uh, at the standard of responsiveness that we want. I, I would caution the member opposite. Uh, uh, you, know, you are from a party, my dear friend, uh, which suggested we could do with 100,000 less public servants. I would argue that the Ministry of Environment uh, uh, is, a, uh, uh, is not an overly funded ministry, and uh, resources are scarce. Uh, so I, I, will take that, I will take that to be a spend question, not a cut question, and would ask as we move forward in budget deliberations that you will have some empathy for my ministry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, one of the most important aspects of a person's life really is the fact that they have a job, a job that is meaningful and is fairly compensated. In Ontario today, we have 70% unemployment rate for people who have a disability. For every 100 people we take off of ODSP and put into the workplace in meaningful and competitively paid jobs, we're saving the economy about a million dollars. Minister, a 70 per cent unemployment rate for people with disabilities in the province of Ontario is frankly unacceptable. What action will this government take to lower this unacceptable level of unemployment? Thank you. Minister of Community and Social Services. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to point out to the member that uh, in our 2013 budget, our government established the Partnership Council on Employment Opportunities for People with Disabilities, composed of government and corporate leaders, to champion the hiring of people with disabilities. And it, in fact, this initiative is uh, led by the Minister of Economic Development employment and, tra and infrastructure, so I will be referring uh, the supplementary to him. However, in general, uh, I'm very encouraged by the interest that this member, uh, the member from Essex is showing in this very important topic. It seems that we share a very similar concern, and so, Mr. Speaker, I'm really puzzled uh, why the member uh, did not support our budget in 2014, uh, because uh, very specifically, we are investing $810 million over three years to help those with disabilities, and in that funding, Mr. Speaker, there is a very important employment and modernization fund Order. to address the issue that he is uh, speaking to. Thank you, Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I repeat, a decent job with decent pay is what we all aspire to. It's what we want for ourselves. It's what we dream of when we grow up, and it's what we expect for our children as well. The Ontario, the Ontario Disabilities Employment Network has long been an effective advocate for people with disabilities who want the very same thing we all do, and they believe much more can be done. A 70 per cent unemployment rate for people with disabilities is simply un unacceptable. Why is this government missing in action when it comes to creating good jobs for those people in our province with disabilities? Thank you. Minister? Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Sir, I followed everything in the member's question with interest until his final statement, which I think uh, went in a totally different direction. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we're a leader internationally when it comes to building accessibility into Ontario. And that's good for people with disabilities, Mr. Speaker. It's also good with our, for our economy. And I think that's something that the member and I can agree on. We have an incredible wealth of talent, Mr. Speaker, that currently is facing barriers to employment. We fully recognize that. It's a, it's a priority for us. Studies have shown that you're looking at seven to ten billion dollars over time that's being lost to our gross domestic product as a result of this lack of accessibility. So we're as determined as you are, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, we have a piece of legislation that's a groundbreaking piece of legislation uh, here in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're working with the with people with disabilities. We're working with leaders in that community Answer. to remove those barriers. And Mr. Speaker, it's a priority for us from a social perspective, but it's also also priority from us from from an economic perspective. Thank you. Member from Ottawa South on a point of order. Point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can beg your indulgence. Uh, we're a little bit late for question period, but I'd like to introduce three members of the Ottawa Police Service: Brian Samuel, Dan Brennan, and Jim Ells. They're here on behalf of the Police Association of Ontario. I'd like to welcome them to welcome them to Queens Park and to thank them and their colleagues for all they do to protect us in the City of Ottawa, especially given the circumstances that we find uh, in our community today. Thank you, Mr. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.